Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. Hi, this is Jess Rappenchek, audio editor for the National Parks Traveler podcast series. I'd like to take a brief moment before today's show to thank you for your support of The Traveler and to ask for your help in reaching our yearly fundraising goal. There are many ways that you can support the National Parks Traveler's work to provide daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas, from direct donations to using Amazon Smile. Here's how you can support the nonprofit news organization on Giving Tuesday as it continues to expand its coverage, both through the written word and weekly podcasts, as well as occasional audio postcards. One, make a direct donation, either one time or, if you can manage it, a recurring monthly donation. While The Traveler reaches roughly 3 million readers and listeners a year, only a tiny fraction of a percent actually supports The Traveler's work. If you have come to value The Traveler's coverage, a direct donation through our website helps ensure that it continues. During November and December, all donations go toward helping The Traveler land a $15,000 matching grant from the National Newsmatch fundraising campaign to support nonprofit media organizations. Two. Use Amazon Smile when you shop on Amazon and be sure to select the National Parks Traveler as your preferred charity. When you shop at smile.amazon.com, Amazon donates 0.5% of your eligible purchases at no cost to you. 3. Consider purchases from our partners, such as Night Sky Posters from Dr. Tyler Nordgren, Outdoor Inspired Jewelry from Park City Jewelers, or Vacation Rentals from Yosemite Scenic Wonders. 4. Check with your company and see if they'll make a matching donation to The Traveler. 5. If you work for a National Park Friends Group or Cooperating Association, ask if the organization could help support The Traveler's mission. 6. If you or your company makes merchandise tied to national parks or operates a business in the parks, consider dedicating a percentage of the sales to The Traveler once a year. And 7. Reach out to friends and family members to encourage them to support The Traveler. Through the years, The Traveler has filled a niche when it comes to national parks coverage, one that continues to grow as daily news organizations across the country go out of business. Teresa Pierno, president and CEO for the National Parks Conservation Association, tells us that, quote, National Parks Traveler's reporting provides a necessary source of rigorous and trustworthy information during a time when our national parks future is uncertain. Our national parks are treasured places that unite and inspire us all. Yet these places continue to face many challenges like underfunding, overcrowding, and the consequences of climate change. Parks need advocates and groups like the National Parks Conservation Association to speak up on their behalf and demand action. We couldn't do our work to the fullest without organizations like the National Parks Traveler and their coverage of the issues that face our parks, their staff, and surrounding communities. National Parks Traveler provides trusted, reliable, and timely information that ensures the NPCA and park advocates across the country can continue our work and protect our nation's most iconic and inspirational places for generations to come. Along with our daily coverage from the park system, feature stories readers and listeners made possible this past year include stories such as Wyoming approves tri-state grizzly hunting pact in delisting push, coral reef overfishing impacting Biscayne, Dry Tortugas, and Everglades National Parks. Unplugged, National Park Service struggling to meet EV challenges. Yellowstone at 150, challenges go more than crowd deep. Scott's Bluff National Monument, portal to the west. Plus, we've released a new podcast episode every week of the year. If you value editorially independent journalism focused on national parks and protected areas, please consider a donation today or on Giving Tuesday. Monthly giving provides the greatest support for the traveler's work, which not only keeps the public informed on the news, science, and adventures in the parks, but aids decision makers, academics, conservationists, and activists. This segment was made possible in part by readers and listeners who support the National Parks Traveler, a small, editorially independent 501c3 nonprofit media organization. The traveler is not part of the federal government nor a corporate subsidiary. Your support helps ensure the Traveler's news and feature coverage of the national parks and protected areas endures. Now, without any further ado, I present this week's show. This week we're meeting with Chef Glenn McAllister, mastermind of BackpackingChef.com, the go-to source for homemade dehydrated meals. 
Freeze-dried meals long have been the go-to food source for many backcountry travelers, but only because they didn't know other options existed for mealtime, and not everyone easily stomachs those meals. This is Kurt Repencheck, your host at the National Parks Traveler. I've been eating freeze-dried meals for longer than I'd like to admit, but recently I've been intrigued by the prospect of making my own dehydrated meals at home to take on the trail or on paddling trips. To explore the possibilities, we're joined today by Chef Glenn, who decided that a 315-mile hike on the Appalachian Trail would be a great shakedown trek for his experimenting with dehydrated meals. That was years ago, and today Chef Glenn, whose full name is Glenn McAllister, runs a website, backpackingchef.com, that is the go-to source for how to dehydrate meal ingredients and what to do with them. We'll be back in a minute with Glenn. The Yosemite Conservancy helps visitors connect with Yosemite through adventures, volunteering, and the arts. It's the only nonprofit dedicated to supporting Yosemite National Park and funds grants to improve trails, restore habitat, protect wildlife, and inspire the next generation of nature lovers. Learn more at yosemite.org. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It's also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference at friendsofacadia.org. The Everglades Foundation, the only organization whose sole mission is to restore and protect America's Everglades. Learn more at evergladesfoundation.org. Welcome to The Traveler, Glenn. Well, thanks for having me, Kurt. I'm happy to be here. So tell us, how did you get into devising a dehydrated meal menu for your AT hike back in 2008? I mean, it's not something that comes to mind overnight. Right, right. Well, just like you, on my early backpacking trips, I was packing the freeze-dried meals. And they're a bit bulky, and some are okay taste-wise and others eh, so-so and wasn't really happy about maybe all the ingredients that went into some of these high salt and such and uh, so I decided that you know I could just dehydrate these ingredients myself and just thinking in terms of the types of meals that I like to eat at home and I was just able to combine the different foods that I dehydrated and, and turned them into to meals and uh, that's that's how I got started. Yeah, and and another thing which I kind of stumbled upon when uh, a buddy and I were hiking a, a section of the Appalachian Trail in in Shenandoah National Park, um, we ran across a through trail hiker, and he told us that um, the the packaged freeze dried foods just didn't carry enough calories for maintaining that type of a pace. Yeah, if you're making your own, you you can certainly pack in. Uh, a lot of calories, uh, with uh, especially with the uh, carbohydrates that you add to the meal. So your rice and potatoes and uh, pasta. So you can definitely make a, a pretty uh, high calorie meal. Yeah, his his go to was olive oil. He said that packs uh, quite a lot of calories and it goes with uh, yeah, very, very dense, very caloric dense, and yeah, a lot of backpackers uh, carry a little bottle of uh, plastic bottle of olive oil and uh, they might just eat eat it by the spoonful or they might just drizzle some into a meal and that definitely does add some very healthy fat calories and i sh- should mention that with dehydration you don't want to uh, dehydrate ingredients that have a lot of fat in them because <laughs> the fat could turn rancid uh, over time so uh, you wouldn't make a meal with olive oil in it uh, mm-hmm. but you could pack it separately and add it on the trail now now back in 2008 when you were getting ready for your hike on the at was this your first attempt at dehydrating meals or had you had some previous experience it was uh i uh well i, I started well in advance i was interested i got very interested in this whole topic and uh so it was really hmm, lots of experimenting over a, a, a couple of months at least. And uh, once I decided to go on a 30-day hike, 
I started drying the food about 30 days in advance and I was packing it up the week before uh, I left for the hike and uh, mailing it off. Uh, so I would stop about every five days at a post office or at a hostel and pick up my next uh, few days worth of backpacking uh, meals. Dehydration is not a quick process. Um, I'm surprised you had 90, 90 meals and you, you, you only started 30 days before your departure date. Yeah, well, I, I bought a, a really big dehydrator. It's a, a nine tray, it's caliber, and mm-hmm. it's got fairly large trays. So uh, the way I work, if I'm, you know, if I'm preparing for a, a trip, uh, I can prepare food twice, usually uh, like in the morning, and then dry the food during the day, and then I can do another round overnight, prepare some more food in the evening, dry it overnight. And so I can move pretty fast. You, know, you have to be organized and know what you want to do, but uh, I, uh, I have the planning tools to, uh, to make it happen. Yeah, yeah. And, and in a little bit, we'll get into some of the, the specific process that you take in, in doing that. But um, were there early mistakes that you could share with us so we don't make them? <laughs> Early mistakes. Well, I, you know, I experimented with a lot of things. And uh, I guess one of the first things would be, say, uh, chicken. Uh, and I discovered early on that you could dry it, but it was very hard to rehydrate it in the meal. So it was super duper chewy, not very pleasant. Uh, but in the course of you know experimenting with cooking it in all, all different ways, I tried just using uh, canned chicken, which is basically pressure cooked right in the can. And something about that pressure cooking changed the the, the meat, so it, it rehydrates quite well. So I just started using canned chicken uh, to dehydrate and, and use in my meals. But after that, I, I actually started pressure cooking my own chicken, and that works pretty well too. Uh, but the very best I've found as far as meat goes is to use uh, ground beef. And, of course, you want to use very lean uh, ground beef or chicken or turkey uh, so that it doesn't have much fat in it. What I learned uh, or discovered is I could add breadcrumbs to it, fine ground breadcrumbs. And also I could use uh, ground oats. And I mix that in with the ground meat before I cook it. And that added starch makes it rehydrate really, really well in a meal. It's like tender, like meatloaf. Uh, really? So, so, you know, going from, uh, you know, if you just want to put like beef jerky in a meal, it's going to be really tough. But uh, ground ground beef uh, cooked with the breadcrumbs is definitely a, a, a way to go. Yeah. So do you have a background in food chemistry or did you just stumble upon this? through? I just like to eat. That's my qualification. (laughs) I like to eat healthy food too. I should add. Yeah. Yeah. You know, coming forward to 2022, I see on your website that you have recipes for Thai peanut noodles, vegan and vegetarian recipes, unstuffed peppers, which sounds really interesting, Mexican beef and chili. And I think I even saw one somewhere for pumpkin pie. Right, right. Is there nothing that doesn't work? Uh, yeah, there, uh, there are some that don't work. Uh, well, with the uh, with the Thai peanut noodles that I put in my last newsletter, um, I used uh, peanut butter powder uh, because uh, the powder has the fat removed from it. Uh, whereas if I wanted to put whole peanut butter in the meal, then it would kind of retain a certain greasiness. And, and so I always avoid any kind of greasy uh, ingredients that would include peanut butter, but the powder mm-hmm. was fine. Uh, it would include uh, any kind of cheesy sauces. They just, they just turn out kind of greasy uh, and uh, you know, just kind of minimizing the oil that I would put into a meal before I dried it. Another thing that uh, I discovered uh, didn't dehydrate well was... Uh, uh, eggs. Uh, one of the things I tried was to uh, hard boil eggs and dehydrate them, but it, it turns into like diamonds. <laughs> they're so they're so hard that you can't do anything with them. But uh, so I love these little challenges. So when things don't work out, I say, "Well, how can I make it work out? What can I do?" 
Uh-huh. And, and so I came up with two different ways. One is in my first book and another is in my second book of making uh, baked scrambled eggs. And I bake them with an, uh, a starch added to them. So the one method is with cooked polenta. And then the other method is with uh, uh, shredded cooked uh, potatoes. And so once I figured that out, now I have scrambled eggs that rehydrate well uh, on the trail. You know, I've, I've got to admit, Glenn, that um, I've been backpacking since, uh, oh, the 70s at least, maybe the late 60s. And yeah. I, I just cannot get excited about freeze-dried eggs. There's just something about that concept that um, scares me away. I don't think I've ever tried them. Um, right. do, well, do some yours... people also carry this uh, Ova Easy, I think, eggs. And they, uh, they mix it up and then they... They scramble it basically in a little frying pan on the trail. So I've heard that that works pretty well also. For breakfast, I mean, there's there's a lot of other options. So I, I love oatmeal. It's one of my favorite things to eat on the trail. But I don't go for those uh, instant uh, flavored oatmeal packets because there's nothing but fake fruit and sugar in them. Uh, they are convenient and they, they cook really quick. But you can just pack Quaker Oats you know, kind of like the quick cooking kind. Sure. You can make them so much better if you dehydrate fruit and take that along with you. And then you've got a really tasty meal, um, you know, much more delicious. Yeah. Hold that thought for a second. This is Kurt Repencheck at the National Parks Traveler. We're talking today with Chef Glenn, who is a master dehydrating food so you can create your own meals at home that are a lot tastier and uh, Probably better for you than the dehydrated, freeze-dried foods you can get in the backpack shop. We'll be back in a minute. Listener and reader support make National Parks Traveler possible every day of the year. If you enjoy the Traveler's content, please consider a donation via nationalparkstraveler.org. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the national park system for decades to come. You can see their successes at gtnpf.org. Whether it be strategy, business planning, change management, or development, executive search, or diversity planning, Potrero Group is here to help. They mix a depth of experience in the parks and land space with a breadth of best practices from other industries. For more information or to schedule a preliminary conversation, go to potrerogroup.com. P-O-T-R-E-R-O group.com. Full of stunning photography and thought-provoking reads, Smokey's Life is a biannual magazine produced by Great Smoky Mountains Association. Members receive it free of charge each spring and fall, and it is available for purchase in retail stores throughout Great Smoky Mountains National Park and online at smokiesinformation.org. So, so Glenn, before the break, um, you were talking about breakfast, and I was I was wondering about that because you know going through your website, you've got all these meals for dinners and lunches and whatnot, and you know I have carried um, the Quaker Oats, the instant Quaker Oats, um, for years. It is quick and easy, just to add water, but your range of flavors is is somewhat limited, and you have you have quite a number of breakfast recipes like uh, omelet bites, Spanish omelet, which sounds really good with onions. Peach crunch and more. What what is your uh, approach to that? Well, one of my favorites, uh, in, uh, it's in the new book, uh, Recipes for Adventure Two, uh, is the uh, pancake bites. And uh, what I did uh, with that is uh, I bake them in the oven, and and so they're nice and thick, and then I, I cut them into little cubes and uh, dehydrate the cubes. So they're, mm-hmm. they're almost like little cookies almost, and they're really delicious. Uh, add a little bit of uh, maple syrup to it before I bake it. And I, I've done it two ways. I've, I've used an egg, and it, it, that holds up well. Uh, but also uh, the uh, seeds uh, that create uh, the same kind of texture as 
uh, flax seeds, that's what I was thinking of, uh, as eggs. And then when I get on the trail, I'll take uh, dehydrated apples or dehydrated bananas and I'll mix that with water in the pot and get it uh, heating up real nicely until it's you know, steaming hot. And then I drop the pancake bi uh, bites on top of the rehydrating fruit and put the lid on the pot and the steam kind of comes up uh, into the pancake bites and rehydrates them. And then right before I eat it, I just stir it all together and uh, it's quite delicious. Can, can you do it with waffles? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a waffle guy. <laughs> yeah, I suppose you could. I, I, I guess you could, you know, just take the kind of, or the, the kind of egos or whatever, you know, and toast no, them no, no. and dry them. <laughs> no, no, I, I would pull out my waffle iron and... and uh, okay, your hiker waffle iron, yeah, yeah. No, no, do it at home, right? Isn't that, yeah. that's, that's the key, okay, you do okay. it at home. okay. Yeah, you yeah. could. It's very similar. You really could, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll have to explore that. Um, yeah. Once I get into dehydrating, it's something that I'm, I'm on the, I'm on the cusp. I mean, and and that's just the thing. I mean, I was I was googling through the internet for the best dehydrator, and there are there are a lot of options, and it seems like every reviewer has a different set of favorites in terms of the the manufacturers, and so, you know, here I am paralysis by analysis i mean how do you how do you move off that uh, that fence about boy i don't know if i should do it if i should do it or not do it right right uh yeah i guess you have to think of you know how how often am i gonna be backpacking you know how much food am i going to dry uh, a lot of people once they get started uh, then they start to uh, maintain a, a an inventory of dried foods for emergencies you might want to have a, a dehydrator that has enough capacity uh, to do the job. So I have I have two. I have one here in Switzerland, uh, which is just a five tray Excalibur, and in in America I, I have a nine tray Excalibur, and I like those because they have a very high capacity for for each tray, and so mm -hmm. I can dry a lot of food in a shorter amount of time. Uh, other dehydrators are generally smaller. The Excalibur is, is the biggest as far as tray size go. Um, but uh, let's see, uh, as far as other brands go, uh, the Nesco uh, dehydrators, they're more of the donut shape. And I'm not really a big fan of the donut shape. It kind of wastes space, uh, and it's a little bit harder to, to, to maneuver food and, and just won't get as much food on those trays as with a, a big square or big rectangular dehydrator tray, but they do work. And, yeah. um, and a lot of people use them. And so I don't want to knock them too much because they do work and they're inexpensive. And so uh -huh. there's a big, there's a big range. Uh, and you know, that, that can be a part of the decision. If you don't know how much you're going to dry, then you might start at the lower end and, and go for a, a Nesco uh, that might set you back uh, you know, as little as seventy nine dollars or one hundred and fifty or so. There is a, a huge range. I mean, I, I saw everything from a hundred and fifty dollar machine that the the reviewers said was perfect up to I think a a thousand dollars. Yeah, uh, right. Uh, the Excaliburs uh, are on the high end. Uh, uh, a nine tray. Is in the neighborhood of about four hundred for twenty nine, right. and you can catch them on sale for fifteen twenty percent off usually. Yeah, uh, but, but that you know that that that's a pretty big, uh, high threshold for somebody just getting started. Uh, but once you're really serious about it, and if you're doing it on a regular basis, you'll be happy that you, you spent the money and, and got a good dehydrator. I would I would you know just tell people also don't go for the ultra cheap ones. So, you know, there's still some out there that don't have a fan. Without a fan, it's just going to take forever and ever. Um, so, you know, I would say, you know, try to invest maybe you know, 150 in a decent Nesco uh, or an, you know, more in a, for an Excalibur. Uh, the Excaliburs are very efficient. You know, they dry probably faster than, than the, the less expensive dehydrators. 
Yeah. Now I'm, I'm curious, and I, I don't know if you'll be able to answer this, but our oven, our wall oven, um, has a dehydration mode. And I remember I, I tried it once and it seemed to take forever. <laughs> and, and I'm, I'm kind of guessing that even these, these countertop dehydrators probably take a good deal of time depending on what you're trying to dehydrate. But a- any idea on the energy usage? Is, is my wall oven just going to suck up the power versus a countertop that's more efficient? I don't recommend the oven at all because it's really an inefficient way uh, to, to dry food and uh, you'll, um, you'll shortly be wasting a lot of energy. But if you're doing it in the winter, at least you're heating your house. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think some people use their oven for making beef jerky. Right. And I think that's a, a realistic way to, to use the oven uh, because beef jerky doesn't really take all that long to, to dry. And the, the grates that are inside your oven are, you know, fairly spaced apart. And so a big strip of meat is going to fall through. But your oven's not going to be very good for drying corn and peas and, and vegetables that shrink. And, uh, you know, with a, with a home dehydrator, you know, you can control the, you know, the proper temperature for the food that you're drying. And it's just much more efficient, I think. And so you 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 do everything. I mean, you mentioned corn, peas, um, any any vegetable you haven't tried. <laughs> I mean, that's a tough question to answer because there's so many vegetables out there. But anything that you thought would be good that wasn't good in terms of dehydrating? Uh, boy, you know, the, I, I love vegetables. I, I, I can't think of any that I don't try. I, I dry a lot of beans mm-hmm. uh, for protein. And uh, I generally use the uh, the canned beans because it's quick and easy. You just rinse them and put them on the dehydrator tray and dry them. Uh, what happens with canned beans is they'll split open in the dehydrator. Mm-hmm. So they're not very pretty in the meals, but they rehydrate extremely well. So uh, that's why I generally, generally use canned beans. But you can, uh, you know, you can use your slow cooker and, and cook uh, from dry beans, you know, over many hours, and you know, do the soaking and all that, and they turn out pretty well. I've pressure cooked beans, and and they don't split open as much. But you know, you put a lot more effort into uh, cooking the beans, so it's really just a personal taste that you want to make your own and use canned beans. But I try to use uh, fresh vegetables whenever possible. Um, but uh, you can also use frozen vegetables, uh, and they turn out fine. I usually steam them for about six minutes before I dry them. And, uh, you know, you can even uh, dry like mixed frozen vegetables. So you're pretty much ready to go. Yeah. yeah. Now, earlier you had mentioned um, for your, your Thai peanut um, dish that you used um, peanut powder. And I'm wondering, you, you also have bark recipes. And um, what is a bark recipe? And can, can peanut butter out of the jar be spread onto a tray and turned into a bark? No. <laughs> That's one of those work. I tried uh, and it didn't work out so well. It's, it's just because of the fat content, it just doesn't go anywhere. So it's just kind of like a blob that starts to maybe turn a little dark in color. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it, it doesn't turn into like some sort of crispy thing that you could maybe even grind into powder or whatever. So... I was really happy to see the uh, the peanut butter powder that you can buy now. And it, when you mix it up with, with uh, warm water or even cold water, really, it tastes just like peanut butter. And, and so it's really easy to pack that and carry it on the trail. So, yeah. so what's, a, what's a bark? What's a bark recipe? Yeah, bark, you know, that was a, a term I gave to it uh, when I started my first experiments. And pretty much it, it covers things that are starchy. Um, so I think one of my favorites of all was uh, sweet potato bark. And, and so, uh, it's just basically cooked sweet potatoes. You can either boil them or you can even bake them. And then you need to thin them out a little bit. And I use, uh, apple juice, uh, to thin them out a little bit. And then I add, uh, some maple syrup to it and, uh, run it through a blender. And then I spread it, uh, thinly on the dehydrator trays. And so the, what I call the final 
product was sweet potato bark. And it makes a really, really delicious snack. Uh, you can just pop it in your mouth and while you're, while you're hiking and you get all those nutrients and it's uh, sweet and tasty. But the other thing that you can do with it, you can put it in a pot with some water and, and heat it up and then it turns into a pudding. So you've got sweet potato pudding and then you can, you know, if you want, you can dump nuts on top of it or, or whatever. And it's the same with the, uh, what I call the pumpkin pie uh, bark. Well, we'll get back. We'll get back to the pumpkin pie. <laughs> <laughs> but l- let me ask you this: um, Can you dehydrate soups? Sure. Yep. There's there's a lot of uh, approaches uh, to making soup. You can make a, a a soup with some sort of starch as one of the ingredients. So again, uh, potatoes is a very useful uh, ingredient to make a thick soup. And uh, basically, you you just cook the soup on, on the stove, you know, add all your spices and herbs and things, whatever vegetables, say like uh, potato broccoli soup or something like that. And uh, you just run it through the, through the blender. And, uh, and then uh, it's very thick and uh, you just spread it out, dry it. And uh, it's going to be bark-like. Uh, if it's really super dry, which it should be, uh, you can even grind it into a powder, and that makes it dehydrate really, really fast back into the soup. And then one of the things I make is a fish chowder, which is similar to soup. And what I do there is I make the fish chowder in a big pot on the stove, and then I take half of the soup and uh, run it through a blender, and then I add it back into the rest of the soup. And so now the whole thing is nice and thick, and then I dehydrate it that way. It sounds like the key here is to to um, boil down the soup, so to speak, to, to get a little thicker than normal. Um, that way you can spread it, and then you're going to add water anyway, so you can thin it out when you're de- re- rehydrated. Yeah, I don't like to boil down too much. I, I just feel like you're kind of overcooking if you're just boiling off water. So I'd rather just thicken it up uh, by, by adding a starch to it. Or it doesn't necessarily have to be a starch. You can, if it's a vegetable soup, you can just take out some of the vegetable solids and uh, blend them and, and stir it back in and just just keep going until it's thick enough so it won't run off your dehydrator trays. Yeah, yeah. No, I make a killer uh, pumpkin soup on the stove, and I'm just wondering how that would work. Um, oh, it works great. I make I make pumpkin soup also. No, oh, good. You good just want to leave out you want to leave out your creamy stuff. So because you don't want you, you don't want to put cream or milk or things like that if you're going to dehydrate it. So you would make it without those items. And then if you're backpacking, you could carry powdered milk to add to it or uh, powdered coconut milk, those kind of things. What about if you used a a fat-free half and half instead of cream or milk? Would that work? Is there such a thing as fat-free half and half? Absolutely, absolutely. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I suppose it would work. Something Uh, to try. I I generally avoid dairy. Yeah. Uh, in, in the dehydrator too, because there's you know milk solids and they could possibly uh, spoil on you. Yeah, yeah. We're talking today with Chef Glenn, who is a uh, pro at making dehydrated meals to take on his uh, backpacking and uh, other adventures um, where he doesn't want to take freeze dried food with him. We're going to take a short break. We'll be back in a minute. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. Show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. An attitude of gratitude can improve the way you manage your money. Enroll in Credit Score for free with Interior Federal Credit Union's digital banking and get started. Staying on top of your credit has never been easier. Join today to experience the benefits for yourself. Membership is required. Interior Federal Credit Union, federally insured by NCUA. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. 
As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to raise private support to deepen everyone's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. Okay, we're back with uh, Chef Glenn. So I'm wondering, Glenn, um, does it take you long to develop a new recipe? I mean, is am I overthinking this? Is it just a matter of cooking something on the stove or in the oven and running it through your dehydrator? Uh, some people just, you know, cook a meal. Especially, a lot of people will, you know, just they'll cook a meal for dinner for the family or whatever, and they'll have a little bit left over, and they just pop the leftovers uh, in the dehydrator. And, and that's one way that, that people do it. And then, as long as that meal didn't include a lot of greasy stuff, uh, it'll work fine. But, you know, the other way is to pull different ingredients together separately. So I think, uh, one of my recent newsletters was, uh, uh a, a Thai red Thai curry. Uh, I did r- uh, red and green and I dried the, the, Thai curry sauce as a bark, and then I combined that on the trail meal with dried rice and dried vegetables. So I had like carrots and bell peppers, and the dried uh, Thai sauce was the flavor uh, ingredient that pulled the whole meal together. Hmm. And uh, with with the noodle, with the Thai peanut noodles, that was kind of a hybrid approach. I cooked uh, linguine and added all the uh, Thai peanut sauce ingredients. Uh, I cooked that up a little bit, and then I poured that over the noodles and mixed it up really well and dried those noodles with the sauce on it. And then when I made a meal for the trail, uh, I added additional dried carrots, uh, and some bamboo shoots, and some colored uh, bell peppers. Uh, I like to add certain vegetables like separately um, Mm -hmm. because they tend to hold their color and taste better, uh, especially, you know, carrots and and bell peppers and things. If you put those ingredients into a meal, like a stew, they kind of get lost in there. They lose their color and you end up with a kind of a, when you rehydrate the meal, it's kind of like all the same texture, kind of a mush. But if you add some uh, dehydrated vegetables, uh, later uh, to the to the dried meal, uh, then they're crunchy and very colorful. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm wondering. Um, again, I'm, I'm overthinking here. At one point, you said that you you take the pasta and you mix it with the sauce and then dehydrate that. Yeah. But but normally you you don't need to dehydrate pasta because it's already dehydrated, right? Uh, no, <clears throat> no, no. You could get away with like. If you use macaroni from a box of macaroni and cheese, Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of a thin macaroni. So that would cook okay as long as you boiled it for at least two minutes uh, in your meal. But I have found it's much better to pre-cook and dehydrate pasta um, because it's very easy to dehydrate it. It dries very fast, four to six hours usually, and that makes it rehydrate very quickly in your dehydrated meals. And so I highly recommend, and it's so it's so simple, you just pre-cook it and dry it. Yeah, um, good, and and the other know. thing that a lot of people are, are doing these days is what they call cold soak rehydration. So they're eating their food cold, and, and so they're making pasta salads, or I'd say, hey, I am too. Um, so if you, if you pre-cooked and dried your pasta, then it will rehydrate with cold water uh, on the trail. Whereas if you hadn't done that, it, it won't rehydrate at all. Hmm. With the cold soak uh, meals, uh, you have to have a long soak time. So that, that's something I do where you, you add the water in the morning and then you eat the meal at lunchtime. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I once ran into a, a backpacker in the, the backcountry of Yellowstone National Park and he didn't have a stove. And so what he thought he, what he, thought he could do was um, in the morning – he had freeze dried meals and he thought in the morning he could add water to his meal for that night and 
put it, put it on the back of his pack or something, and that by the time he got to camp, that it it'd be ready to eat. I'm I'm not sure that is a good approach or not. <laughs> well, you could eat it. <laughs> <laughs> if you're hungry, you'll eat anything. Yeah, yeah. You know, I've uh, I've designed a lot of recipes that are kind of salad like. Mm-hmm. You know, things you would might normally eat. You know, pasta and rice salads. I have a sushi rice bowl that I uh, that I make. And so, you know, those are things you would expect to eat cold. Mm-hmm. And so, and you know, especially uh, in the summer when you're hiking and it's hot out, um, that's really refreshing. But, you know, if it's like, you know, spaghetti or, or some meal that you would normally eat hot, uh, it's not going to be all that enjoyable to eat it cold. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't think so. So, you know, the, the whole thing is just to, to they want to cut down on, on their weight that they're carrying it and they don't want to carry the fuel in the stove and you know i respect that but uh, I'm, I'm definitely willing to hang on to my fuel and stove for sure yeah yeah now i understand you like to dehydrate in bulk quantities so to speak and then store them in airtight containers and then mix up your meals before your trip depending on what you want to eat on your trip what, what's the shelf life of your ingredients well uh i've gone uh, i've used ingredients that were several years old and, and it's just fine. Uh, I store all kinds of food in uh, jars with tight lids, and uh, I put uh, oxygen absorbers in those jars, and I store them uh, in a dresser uh, so there's no light uh, hitting the food. And uh, so it, you know, it's a it's a great way to store food. I, I do recommend, if at all possible, to use up your dried food uh, at the end of the year or you know, within a year's time. I think that's when it's at the best quality. Uh, I know, you know, in, in fact, I even got a, a mail today from somebody who, who wanted to dehydrate food and, and, and he wanted to hang on to it for 15 years. Hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm not so sure that's a, a great idea. It might work, but I think there's going to be a decline uh, in some of the nutrition and some of the appearance. Uh, with freeze-dried meals where they say you've got a shelf life of 30 years or more, uh, the difference is freeze drying removes 98% of the water. So there's, there's absolutely no water, about 2%, uh, to, to react with enzymes and stuff that are present in the food, uh, which, which could cause them to, uh, you know, break down in terms of their nutritional content or their appearance, their colors and such. But with uh, home dehydration, you're going to be drying into the range of 85 to 95% water removal. So that does leave a little bit more water and the potential for that, just a little bit of water to uh, interact with with enzymes. And and it's not like it's going to happen fast, but it does happen over time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you want to go longer with it, then definitely uh, you have to be airtight and you have to use uh, oxygen absorbers or a a vacuum sealer that that does not, uh, is not subject to the bags. Uh, leaking or being punctured. So, yeah, I, I don't really think uh, a long term uh, is, is great for the home dehydration. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and backing up a little bit, I, I guess I should clarify that you make um, your meals and dehydrate them and store them, but then you also have your, your, your fruits and you know your vegetables, like your diced up uh, peppers and whatnot. So it's not like you're um, the night before your trip coming up with a meal. From scratch. Oh, I always know what I'm. Yeah, I, I've got like a menu planning, uh, food drying workbook that uh, that I offer to people on the website. And, uh, so you know, I always have a plan. I know how much I'm. I need to dry uh, for the meals that I want to make because I've got you know all the recipes are written down and everything. I, I'm usually packing up the actual meals, uh, depending on if I have to mail something ahead. You know, maybe a, a week or two uh, ahead before before I, I take the hike. Right. Right. Yeah. Now, there are um, some meals like chili. Chili is one of my uh, favorite meals that I do cook the whole meal and dry it as a whole meal. Dry it and put it in the bag. Yeah, no, that sounds good. That sounds good. And, you know, we just came through Thanksgiving and, and I, I wanted to go back to your pumpkin pie. I mean, what is what is your pumpkin pie? How, how does it come together? Well, it couldn't be simpler. Uh, it's, it's a lot like the sweet potato. Uh, you can use uh, uh, an edible pumpkin if you want and uh, steam the pumpkin, or you can just use uh, uh, a can of pumpkin from the store. Mm-hmm. And uh, so 
pretty much you're just combining that pureed pumpkin uh, with, uh, again, I use apple juice. It's kind of a neutral uh, thinner, but has a little sweetness to it, a little apple flavor, and maple syrup. Hmm. And uh, you just you know, blend it till it's smooth, spread it out on the dehydrator trays, and it, uh, it turns into like a, a chip. And uh, again, you can uh, eat it just like that, uh, or you can rehydrate it with warm water and kind of form it into a little pie, pie-shaped wedge. And uh, you can add uh, pecans to it or any little extras that you might want. And it's, it's a great treat. That does sound like a great treat. And, you know, this has been, a, a, for me personally, a fascinating discussion, Glenn. And it's got, got a lot of thoughts going through my mind. And um, I, I think I'm going to run out and uh, get a dehydrator and, and see if I can master that before uh, the next paddling season comes around. Um, I'm happy to help you if you have any questions along the way. Well, I was going to say, um, um, anybody out there listening who wants to learn more about um, dehydration of foods and meals and wants to go down the road, I'm going to try and go down. Backpackingchef.com is Glenn's website, and you, you have a free newsletter if people sign up for it, right? I do. It's called Trail Bites. Yeah, I send it out once a month, and you were asking how, you know, how I come up with recipes. So that's always a big motivator for me to come up with a new recipe. Uh, so I, I, I deliver a new recipe and some sort of a dehydration technique uh, in each of my newsletters and a little bit of folksy humor, and uh, I send it out once a month. You know, I, I signed up for it the other day, so I just got the first one, but um, I'm looking forward to getting the rest of them because it sounds like you you have um, helped people like me avoid all the mistakes that I would make otherwise. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> At least that's what I'm hoping for. If not, I know where to find you in Switzerland. <laughs> yeah. Well, Glenn, thanks so much for joining me today. It's been uh, really interesting, and um, it, it just sounds like it's such a, an easy way to, to get more flavorful and, in some cases, more nutritious meals um, that you're going to enjoy eating at the end of the day on the trail. Well, Kurt, it's, it's been a pleasure to talk to you, and thanks so much for inviting me on. That's our show for this week. We hope you found it inspiring for creating your own meals. With November just about over, we're nearly halfway through our year-end fundraiser. This is the main event, if you will, for attracting the revenues we need to keep you informed, not only on how to enjoy national parks and protected areas, but on understanding the threats they face. Please help us keep you up to date on all things national parks with a donation. For The Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck. See you in the parks. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park Audio Series in the world and provides the background music for National Park's Travelers podcasts. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. Editing and production work for the National Parks Traveler podcast is done by Splitbeard Productions. You can learn more about us at splitbeardproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.